Oh, that was awesome. I want to let everyone know um, all the slides you saw, a lot of good detail, both uh, presenters, uh, we will make available afterwards. When we do our recap, email alert and we'll sum it up. So we'll make all their contact information available. We'll put their presentations in a link so you can uh, retrieve the information <laughs> that way. And so also it's critical that we have your contact information. So when you came in, if you're new to BizFed or you're new to this event, you'll want to make sure and drop off uh, your card to our folks at the front table. So then we'll include you directly on all of our email communications afterwards and make all this available to you, okay? Um, Colleen, thank you. That was great. You, can, you were uh, very clear and succinct and helpful in a, a very messy, unknown, chartered territory. So brilliant. I, I don't know. Kudos to you. That was good. Um, I also want to ask Jason at SCAG. There was a lot of discussion about SCAG and then a lot of discussion on the municipalities and how do they proceed with the agencies and the Strategic Council and so on. Jason. Would you mention to me in the lobby that SCAG is preparing to have um, an educational forum of some of sorts? Can you tell us about that and when it, is it? And sure, we don't have a fixed date yet, but in early July, we are looking to host a regional forum with a wide variety of stakeholders. So we get everybody in the same room and have discussions to really strengthen applications for the next round of the AHSC now that we're much further ahead in understanding what those program guidelines are and how the money appears to be getting allocated throughout the state. We want to really strengthen how this region fares in this next round, and we're already in that next round as far as we're concerned. Mm -hmm. So we know that the notice of funding availability will be released <coughs> later this year, at the latest beginning of next year. So people need to hear up now, and that's why we hope to have this forum in early July. So please keep an eye on our website, and we'll also do Okay, and so then include that, get that to us, and in the recap that we do post-meeting, we can get that out to everyone here as well, if, if you have it determined, okay, and then a way to register and so on. Okay, we're all here to get each other's back, right? Help each other out. Also, I'll tell any of you in the room, if you have valuable intel and information after today's conference that you think would be well shared with, with one another, you're also welcome. David England from my team right here. David, stand up. Um, he will take any other information that you want to share with us and we'll bring it in and we'll sift it and help disseminate it as well, okay? Um, do you guys know that we, that California has one cap and trade trading partner? We have one partner in the world and it is Quebec. Formal Arrangement Cap and Trade Alliance and Elaine Hood, Elaine was here, where is he? He left? Oh, I got the wave out. Um, he's the director of, uh, appointed um, director from Quebec that covers California. He's based here in Los Angeles. And um, so it's an interesting dynamic that actually companies in Quebec, companies in California can trade credits with one another. And so we also want to help provide information on that. I was going to have him say a few remarks, but he had to uh, scoot out. But we'll follow up in our post-meeting uh, information as well. That's a, it's a crazy how it's like this unknown, strange fact, but there it is. So we'll, we'll get into that. And then also, I want to recognize, as you guys heard earlier, Senator Pavley was a co-author to AB 32 that got this whole ball rolling. And Senator Pavley's field representative, um, Robella Gonzalez, Rosalba Gonzalez, please stand and say hi to everyone. We're glad to have you with us. Now we get to transition, so that means shift in your seat, shift left, right, whichever you're doing, stretch your legs, okay, because now we're going into our hot panel. And of course, with any hot panel, you got to have a hot moderator. We got Bob Wyman in the house. Um, he is amazing. Um, and so what he's going to do, you know, our belief, obviously, right, is bringing people together from a variety of perspectives. You're hearing some of them already. But now's the fun part on the panel where we actually, he will encourage people and facilitate challenging each other, challenge uh, preconceived notions, get a variety of perspectives, and then let's seek to understand our wildly different outlooks and opinions oftentimes, and sometimes we're pretty close and not that far apart. Um, Bob Wyman, for those 
two of you in the room that don't already know him, he's famous in the world, uh, as a partner at Latham and Watkins. And he serves uh, uh, there as the firm, by the way, Latham and Watkins is like the fifth largest law firm in the world, okay, and they have a lot of uh, lawyers here in LA. Bob is the global chair of the Environment, Land and Resources Department, and the co-chair of the firm's Air Quality and Climate Change Practice Group. That's a big mouthful of a lot of muck and yuck and exciting stuff, and it takes brilliant people like Bob to uh, help all of us navigate that. He splits his time between Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., obviously, environmental protection and so on, and energy, a lot of action happens, comes out of our capital, our nation's capital in D.C., so Bob's there a lot of the time. And he heads up the National Climate Coalition and the California Climate Coalition, which are a lot of diverse business coalitions and the public and private sector, and they focus on energy and the manufacturing sectors. So Bob recently uh, represented a broad group of power plants, refiners, financiers, emission credit firms, and trade associations as interveners on behalf of the state of California to support AB 32 against litigation brought by the Citizens Climate Lobby and our, child, our Children's Earth. He represented individual companies and business associations in federal and state court in a variety of actions brought under the Clean Air Act and state environmental statutes. He's a serious person uh, tackling serious issues in, in, in the complex sort of you know, state of California wide, but the nationwide too. And um, he's also a member of the American College of Environmental Lawyers. A lot of, uh, you know, every good session has to have multiple good lawyers, right? So Bob is the lawyer of the lawyers. Um, he's the National Law Journal recognized Bob as one of the three most, I want to know the other two people, one of the three most influential U.S. energy and environmental attorneys of the decade. Not just this year, last year, but this whole decade. I love it. Um, and for 18 years, he had the torture, or no, had the privilege, excuse me, of uh, being on the U.S. EPA Clean Air Act Advisory Committee, and he testified on multiple occasions before Congress on a vi variety of Clean Air Act subjects. Bob graduated, it was while we're on the university role, so Bob's from Princeton University, so we're covering a lot of territory in the higher ed today. And um, also graduated with honors from the University of Virginia Law School. I have to give a shout out. David England says that's why you're brilliant, because David's a <laughs> elected official from the state of Virginia, represented his people there for three fine terms, so we'd go Virginia. Um, so anyway, Bob, will you please come up? Uh, we're excited to have you moderate our panel, and then uh, your panelists can go ahead and start making their way to the stage as well. Thanks. Okay, I, obviously I need to get out my wallet. How much was that, Tracy? <laughs> $2. Yeah, well, my apologies to you all to have to sit through all of that. that um, I didn't intend to inflict any of that on you, and a lot of it was not from me. So uh, thank you very much, Tracy. Um, I'm going to say a few things before we get the panel started. Uh, and I want to go back to our friend from Texas, because I think you had it absolutely right, as did Bill Clinton when he ran for office. It's the economy stupid. Um, nothing is more important as we think about how to make AB 32 and its progeny succeed than keeping an eye on that ball. If we don't have not just jobs, but good jobs, good jobs that can employ our future generation in this state, everything else will disappear. But many of us in the room, probably all of us in the room, will remember how quickly the political will for environmental progress disappeared overnight, in a nanosecond, during the power crisis, when both Governor Davis and various Air District uh, executive officers, with the stroke of a pen, with um, emergency declarations, obliterated various environmental requirements when the economy demanded it. Let's not put ourselves in that position. That kind of crisis response could happen again, and it just can't, because we do have a political will in the state to be environmental leaders. And so it means 
if we're going to be environmental leaders globally, which I think our, our citizens and our businesses almost universally support, that means we have to be smart economically about how we implement AB 32. And of course, as all of you in this room know, AB 32 is not just the cap and trade program, which is essentially just sort of a backstop to all the other programs, which are called complementary measures. And that includes, of course, performance standards, carbon intensity performance standards for motor vehicles, for electric generating units, for transportation fuels, and performance standards for communities. All of those are complementary measures that are on top of or in addition to the cap and trade program. And they have economic consequences and they need to be efficiently designed and administered. So it's great to hear about all the money coming down the, the pipeline and it's great to stand in line for that money. But I just wanna take a step back before we have this panel to recognize what I, I know everybody in this audience knows implicitly, which is that when funds of that magnitude are transferred from the marketplace to government for allocation, there's a risk of suboptimal allocation of those funds. And the net effect is that costs will rise for employers, energy costs that, are, that essentially are reflected in the auction uh, activity. Now that's, that's appropriate where we have market failure. And for example, in disadvantaged communities, we may have market failures where the environmental impacts experienced there are not internalized into the market and priced, and therefore it's appropriate to assign revenues to remedy those externalities that the market does not address properly. But we have to be very careful because my own personal feeling is that we are so far beyond remedying market failures in this design that we run great risk of destroying our ability to be environmental leaders overnight. And we don't wanna do that. We wanna get this right. So I would make uh, a few observations before I turn it to the panel um, and their recommendations associated with first, associated with them. First of all, um, we talk a lot about sustainability in the state, but we don't talk enough about the importance of producing in the state, not just energy, fuels and electricity, but also goods and services, um, because we have one of the largest consuming populations in the world, and therefore we need to co-locate the extent we can energy production and manufacturing. Otherwise, if we push those out of state because of the high costs incurred in the state, that's not a sustainable strategy because the transportation of fuel and goods will have an environmental impact. So while we obviously are a global economy and we'll always have crisscrossing networks, it's a good thing to co-locate energy and manufacturing with consumption. And we don't explicitly recognize that. And in fact, the local myopia of evaluating environmental impacts through CEQA and other regulations drives a lot of those services and uh, activities out of the state and there are sustainability costs related to that that we need to correct. So we need to be explicit about the sustainability formula for our state and the relationship between production and consumption. The second is we need to be very careful about our instrument choice. Cap and trade, I think, is widely acknowledged, and panelists can, can, of course, debate this, as a very efficient tool. Complementary measures, that is to say, specific measures to drive towards outcomes, whether it's in lowering the carbon intensity of fuels, vehicles, electricity, or communities, tends to be a little more costly than does the cap and trade program as a strategy to reduce tons of greenhouse gases. If you envision a cost curve from on the left side of the curve, uh, strategies that actually can save us money and a lot of energy efficiency saves us money, so pays for itself. But as you move to the right of the cost curve and you get to things like carbon capture and sequestration, reducing greenhouse gas tons gets very expensive. The, the value of a cap and trade program if designed with simplicity 
is you stay to the left of the curve because you maximize the choice of compliance for the participants. The problem with complementary measures from an economist standpoint is you are jumping to the right of the cost curve for particular strategies. And you're saying, well, okay, we know we could get a ton of greenhouse gas reductions the next ton over here on the left of the curve, but we kind of want a certain outcome, whether it's low carbon fuels or vehicles or whatever, or electricity. So we're going to jump to the right. Now, sometimes that's prudent if you feel you need to jumpstart a technology that faces the, 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 you know, the, the dreaded uh, valley of death in the financial cycle between laboratory and commercialization. Because unlike, as we all recognize, unlike the internet, this is a capital intensive world we're in to transport the energy economy. It costs a lot of money. So you may want to move to the right of the cost curve for specific outcomes for specific technologies which you know to be strategic. But again, be very, very careful because that comes with a price. And you can see it in the cost of the low carbon fuel standard, which is twice the cost per ton of greenhouse gas reduced of what the price is in the cap, cap and trade auction. Instead of $12 a ton, it's in the 20s per ton. So we're making a choice as a state when we, when we add that complementary measure to move to a more expensive measure. Uh, similarly, uh, the other strategies are higher on the cost curve. And so the second recommendation I would make is over time, we need to transition away from those complementary measures when, we have, when we've actually succeeded in catalyzing those outcomes and jumpstarting those technologies. We need to have the discipline to converge back to the single more efficient instrument of cap and trade because if we don't, we're going to lose jobs because the energy costs will be higher. How much higher? Well, just to look at the cap and trade program here, it's about $12 per ton in the recent auction. In the Northeast, their, um, their auction was around $2 a ton for a while. It's now around five. They're still twice. We're still twice their cost. And we have a lot of neighbors who have much cheaper electricity than we do. And we know what happens if, you, if that remains sustained for a long time. Employers, when they choose where to locate or where to grow, will certainly not choose the high cost uh, site, they'll choose the low cost site. So the second thing is let's converge these complementary measures to the, cap and, the single cap and, cap and trade program when appropriate. The third is that because we are environmental leaders and because we are to the right of our cost curve, because we're doing more than other states, and we applaud that, at least many of us do, I think most of us do, we will be to the, to the right of our cost curve and therefore incurring greater energy costs than many of our competitor states and nations. But, but there is a way to recapture that value uh, and to be rewarded economically for being a leadership state. And that's by linking our program with other jurisdictions and trading our surplus, our overperformance with those states and thereby recouping much of the investment that we made as a leadership state and letting those dollars come back in through the trading program to reduce our energy costs. That's a missing link currently, with the exception of Quebec, which unfortunately is a relatively small marketplace. But we have an opportunity because EPA is rolling out the National Clean Power Plan, and there will be 47 other states at least who will be subject to that and who will be very interested in buying credits for California's overperformance. We need to get those revenues back in the state to mitigate our energy costs so that we don't pay an unacceptable price for our environmental leadership. And I think if we do those three things, if we are explicit about sustainability and the desirability of co-locating production and consumption, if we converge our instruments of choice into the cap and trade as a single market reasonably promptly, and we link and trade with other sectors and recapture the monetary value of our leadership investment, then we can do awesome things in this state, and we will. If we don't do those things, we will probably find ourselves back where we found ourselves before in a situation where the, we lose the political will, and that would be a shame because we are a leadership state and we can succeed at this.